Well, welcome to church, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. So glad you're tuning in online all around the globe. We love our church family. And God gave us two words for this church a long time ago. If you know them, shout them out with me, everybody. Come on. Hope and healing. Hope for tomorrow and healing from our yesterday. It's all found in the relationship with Jesus Christ. Today, we have an incredible guest speaker. He's a friend of this house. He's an incredible leader, an incredible pastor. He's been a missionary, a professor, and now sits on the executive team of missions.me. This is an organization that we have been on multiple mission trips with, and he's training leaders around the world, not only in communication, but also as an author. And today, we're a big church of honor. I wonder, can you all stand to your feet? Come on, church, let's all stand to our feet. Let's clap our hands for Pastor Chris Estrada, everybody. Wow. Oh my gosh. Man, I'm so excited to be in church this morning. Anybody about hyped about being in the building this morning? Come on. I remember when I woke up on Sundays and didn't know where I was at, but I'm glad I'm found in the house of God this morning. Anybody excited? Man, thank you so much for the love and the honor. You may be seated. Wow, I just, you know, I'm gonna keep it 100. I'm, I'm too Hispanic not to do that. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm gonna just keep it 100. You people are spoiled rotten up in this church right here. I mean, you got good worship. Come on, give it up for the worship team. You got incredible leaders from generation to generation. Come on, give it up for those that are leading your youth and leading, go, let's see, you need to take them to camp. Uh, I'm telling you, you got just this dynamic uh, uh, perspective and leadership level across the whole staff. I mean, you people are spoiled up in here. If you ever complain about this church, you might as well punch yourself in the throat, all right? You got problems, all right? I'm telling you that right now. But I think all of that is a pure reflection of some incredible leadership, and I think that's found in Pastor Sean and Pastor Diana. Come on, can you give God a great thank you and amen for, what, for, for incredible leaders like them? Wow, I have, I have been looking forward to this and uh, excited about this moment, but recognizing this is my first time to Fellowship Church. Let me tell you my story so you know where this crazy Mexican is coming from, okay? Um, I grew up on the border of the United States and Mexico, and you probably have heard of my city, but at one time it was for all the wrong reasons because nobody vacations in my city. Like, you only go there for one of two reasons, fam. Number one, you go there to visit family, or number two, you go there to do something illegal. That's the only, I'm not lying. I'm not, like, I, if you've heard about where all the cartel wars, all the drug, uh, all the drug trafficking, all the kids, okay, those are all my cousins. <laughs> so Christmas is fun, or the FBI was kicking in the front door. There was never an in-between. So by the age of 12, as you can imagine, I found myself with a drug addiction, a lust problem, and an anger issue, but I love to play basketball. Come on, anybody love to hoop in here? Come on, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm torn. I'm, I'm a Mavericks fan because I'm from Dallas, but I love Golden State too, so I'm happy with whoever wins. But um, I, uh, I remember I would go and play basketball at all these open gyms, and there was this church that had a gym, and they would open it right before their youth service, and then they would get all the students from the gym into the service. Well, I would never stay. I would dip and leave and find somewhere else to play. But the youth pastor got involved in my life. One day he came to me and said, hey, do you wanna go to church camp? Now, honest to God, I had no idea what this was. All right? He said, hey, do you wanna go to church camp? I said, there are gonna be hot girls at this camp. There'll be fine women at this camp. I'm gonna invest my time wisely. And he said, he said, well, we're gonna go for Jesus. I said, fine, you can go for, I was a 16 year old little pervert. I had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, you can go for Jesus. I'm gonna go to get some phone numbers. <laughs> I'm going to camp. What I didn't realize is on the first night of that camp, your boy got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and called into ministry all in one night, baby. Game changing night for me. And from that point forward, uh, uh, God has used my wife and I. We've stepped into missions. We've stepped into pastoring. We've stepped into business. And now we get to carry this incredible vision at Missions Me to unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And there's no way, obviously, we could do this on our own or even myself. I've been married now for almost 18 years. I have four beautiful kids. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. She wants more. I don't. Pray for her. Not me, she's got demonic influence. So, But I can't think of a better place to be than right here at Fellowship Church this morning. Come on, anyone else? Now, I don't know if you, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you can tell, I don't do no quiet church. I'm, I'm too Hispanic for that. 
All right, where the caramel people are? Where the brown? Come on, talk to me. Car yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then we got some chocolate in the room. Where you at, chocolate? <laughs> yeah, everybody loves some chocolate. And we got a lot of whipped cream up in this room this morning. So it don't matter what flavor you are. Everybody got sweet tooth up in here. All right, so I can't have you going quiet on me. If you go quiet, you're going to see this Mexican with a mic get real insecure. And I'm going to throw it at myself. So I need you to talk back to me. Can you do that? Somebody say yes. yes. Say, come on, somebody. Say, <laughs> right? Say, come on, somebody. Yes. Say, Simone, come body. Simone. I don't even know how to spell that. That's like a big word like mayonnaise. I don't even know how to spell that. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Come on, church. Are you ready for the word? Yes. I believe it. I believe it. All right. Hey, turn on your Bible and go to 2 Kings 6. Yes, turn it on. I know what generation we live in for crying out loud. If you open your Bible, that's fine. If you turn it on, that's fine. My Bible says the word of God is living and active, not what it's written on or shows up on. And so 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'm going to give you some, a blank canvas here because we're kind of, kind of parachuting in the middle of a situation. In 2 Kings, especially chapter 6, you'll find that the king of the Syrian nation is constantly creating drama and conflict with the nation of Israel. And he's coming up with these wicked, demonic ideas to invade into the nation of Israel. And so he'll get an idea, and then he will share it. And out of his mouth, he'll share it to his generals, his counselors, his advisors. And they will hear it and put the plan into motion. But it ends up in a pair of ears he didn't expect. The Bible says that this would also end up in the hearing of the prophet Elisha. Now, I love Elisha. I even named my firstborn son after this man. I love Elisha, a true prophetic gift, strong prophetic gift. And so he hears, even when, as soon as this stuff would leave the king's mouth, he would hear it in the spirit, and he would report it to the king of Israel. And then the king of, he would tell the king of Israel, hey, you better send reinforcements, you better send garrisons, you better fight off this attack because it's coming, here's the place and time. And so sure enough, they would do that, and the Bible's very clear. It says time and again. Elisha would warn the king of Israel and they would begin to uh, fight off the surprised attack. So this wicked king starts getting all kinds of frustrated, calls that same circle of advisors in and says, which of you is the traitor? I've got a leak in this administration. Which of you is informing my plans to the king of Israel? And they're like, oh, 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 oh it's not us, my lord, the king, right? They said, Israel has a prophet who hears everything you say, even in the privacy of your own bedroom. I mean, awkward, let's be honest, awkward, because that pillow talk ain't going to stay on the pillow very long, right? So he said, well, tell me where Elisha's at, then I may seize him. And they said, well, Elisha's at Dothan, which means cutting. That's a whole other message. So we're going to pick up right here in verse 14, and it says, so one night, the king of Syria sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops horses, and chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? Elisha's uh, young servant, the young man cried to Elisha, don't be afraid. Come on, this is, this. if God could respond to any situation right now in your life, I'm sure these words would begin to echo through your spiritual heart and the chambers of your soul. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid about the job. Don't be afraid about the marriage. Don't be afraid about the babies. Don't be afraid about the prosperity. Don't be afraid about the promotion. Don't be afraid about the doctor's report. Don't be afraid about the court case. Come on, I don't know who I'm talking to, but don't be afraid. You are not allowed to subscribe to fear. He says, don't be afraid. Watch this. For there are more with us than against us. Come on, we got numbers, baby. We got numbers. Look at verse 17. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. Say that with me. Open his eyes. Say it again. Open his eyes. And let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. My goodness. As the Aramean army began to advance toward Elisha, he prayed, O oh Lord, Please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Let's pray for a moment, and then we're going to unpack this. There's, there's so much here, all right? So let's pray. Holy Spirit, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ to flood every heart. I thank you for every man. I thank you for every woman. And I speak over the atmosphere of their life that I say that this atmosphere is full of faith. It is full of hope. 
It is full of peace. It is full of joy. It is full of building. It's full of healing. And I come against every limit, every restriction, every barrier, every poverty mentality, every demonic harassment. I say is broken right now in Jesus' name. And I call your men and women into their season. I call them into their rhythm. I call them into their destiny. I call them into their identity. I call them into strength. I call them into risk. And I call them into courage. And that you would begin to establish a fresh desire for the impossible, for unfamiliar territory for developing great strength in the eyes of God that the Spirit of God and the anointing of heaven would fall on them and they would take fresh ground in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. 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 feel like praying this morning. You know, I want to speak to you from this subject because I think it's absolutely necessary right now. I want to speak to you about having four eyes. I believe that we are called to have not just natural sight, but spiritual side as well. I had glasses when I was a kid, and when I got picked on, I got picked on, I was called four eyes. And I really took that as you now, being an adult, understanding a spiritual lens to my life, that although what I see in the natural may be true in this realm, what I see from heaven's perspective can completely override what I see on the earth. That's why I don't live from earth to heaven. The Bible says to live from heaven to to earth. Are you following me? I'm called to see with four eyes. I believe that our natural sight will get us to places that even our degrees, our experience, our salaries, all of those things that matter will never take us there because we were able to see it before it happened. We were able to know the strategy before it needed a playbook. We knew the blueprint before it was built. And that wasn't because we were that good. It was because we have four eyes. I've got some spiritual sight. Are there any dangerous people in the building this morning that said, I'm not just going to live here. I may exist here, but I am anchored up there and I refuse to let headlines and social media feeds and culture wars and propaganda begin to shape how I look. I want the word. I want the spirit of God. I want the blood. I want the cross to add layers of me looking through my life and my marriage and my babies and my future and my past. Where are the dangerous ones at this morning? Where are the risk takers at this morning? Where are the Joshua's and the Caleb's that can go into enemy territory and say it's ready. It might be overrun. It might be overwhelming. But baby, I didn't come here to be threatened. I came to be the threat. Where are the spiritually alive, the spiritually sighted? Where? We need to have four eyes. I remember one time I was coming out of the gym and uh, don't be that impressed. It was a dodgeball tournament. And, uh, I, you know, we had gotten eliminated early, and I'm, I, I, I'm competitive. I don't know about anybody else, but I like to win. I don't play to lose. I play to win. It, I'm even with my kids. I don't even let my kids beat me. Now, I'm not lying. Like, I don't matter if I'm playing NBA 2K or I'm playing a matching game with my five-year-old. I plan on destroying you. Because, I, like, I'm not, I'm not going to give you no easy W. In the Estrada house, you earn your Ws. I mean, like, yeah, I'm not lying. I'm like... It don't matter what it is. I'm not going to prepare you for a world that doesn't exist. Because in the real world, your boss doesn't give you a participation trophy and says, good job. <laughs> right? I, come on. I, 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 you're going you to get a W. And don't come cry to me about, I always lose. You don't let me win. No, you got to put in the blood, sweat, and tears, little boy, to win this matching game. <laughs> I'm not, I remember one time I, I, I put my son in a league. And uh, apparently, I didn't know this, but this league didn't keep score. Like, but I did. Yes, I did. I remember one time my son got in the car. Dad, we won. Uh, no, you didn't. <laughs> no, no, coach told us we won. Well, apparently I pay coach to lie to you. But this was the real score. I, I, listen, so I'm super convinced. So we got eliminated early, so I was in some kind of mood. I'm walking out of the gym, okay? And I get a text message on my phone. It's like three text messages. First one was, yo, what's up? Next text message, is this Darnisha? Next text message. This Antoine from Saturday night. Now, honest to God, church, I'm telling, honest to God, I meant to say this is not Darnisha. But the autocorrect on my phone said this is Darnisha. <laughs> to which Antoine responded back, sup, girl? <laughs> so I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so I just responded back. I said nothing, he, 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 emoji, 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 and baby, it was on. He said, what you doing right now? I said, I just got out the gym. I'm kind of tired. 
He said, you should go to bed then. I'm thinking, oh, oh, look, look at Antoine, 15 seconds in my life, speaking godly wisdom. So I go home, I shower, I get in bed. I'm lying in bed. My wife is next to me. She's reading her Bible. She's the real Christian. I'm just the preacher. And so everyone knows that if it's nine o'clock, I'm in bed. No, most of the time, I like to go to bed at nine. I like to wake up 435. I just love early mornings. I love the silence. I love the quiet. I've been that way since high school. So I'm lying in bed. My whole team, our family knows, don't text me after 9 p.m. So sure enough, I'm falling asleep, and all of a sudden, I hear my phone go off. And I'm thinking, that, that could only be one person. Sure enough, it was Antoine. He said, sweet dreams, baby girl. So I started laughing out loud, literally, while I was responding. I was like, ha, 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 don't even know. He don't even know. I'm sitting there saying it, and my wife's like, who's that? I said, that's Antoine. She said, who's Antoine? I, 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 what does he want? I said, well, he, he want to talk to Darnisha. She said, who's Darnisha? And I said, well, life's funny. I said, I'm Darnisha. She said, hold up, you're a married man pretending to be a woman talking to another man. And I said, baby, when you say it like that, it sounds bad. <laughs> this went on for two weeks. Oh, yes, it did? I'm that pastor. Look, I'm going to have fun with my life. I don't know what you're doing, but I came here to party. <laughs> like, I'm going to have a good time, all right, <laughs> no matter where I'm at. So, like, I remember this one, and I would, I would take screenshots of our conversation, and I would post it online. And I had people from all over the world following me and following this, like Days of Darnisha, hashtag Days of Darnisha, Darnisha with an E because she's a deep soul, independent woman. Anyways, so like Darnisha and people would be like, keep it going, keep it going. And I would have church, I really would have. But then Antoine one day said, hey, I want to see you again. <laughs> and I thought, well, next time you see her, you're going to notice some things have changed. <laughs> maybe upgraded, I don't know, maybe, maybe. I knew as soon as he saw me, he would recognize, I am not who I said I was. I wonder if this is what the enemy freaks out about right now. As mass deception is crowding into our schools, as it's coming into marriages, as all these smoke screens and hoodwinks and bamboozles and scandals are trying to creep into your thoughts and your emotions, I wonder if he's saying, if I don't get them to see me as I really am, let me remind you, he is defeated, he is de-armed, he is dethroned, and he will no longer have any... Let me remind, Isaiah 14 says one day, we will look down on him and say, is this the one? Is this the one that caused disease? Is this the one that caused havoc? This is the one that caused divorce? This is the one that caused depression? We will look. I say, let's start the party a little bit early and let's start trash talking our way right into victory. You are still the one that has no authority. You are still the one that doesn't get the final say. You don't get to have hands on my babies or my family. I'm here to tell you, I've got a spiritual sight and I know every move before you know. Why? Because I have four eyes. I don't just exist with natural sight. Baby, I got spiritual sight too. And if we're going to do this right, we get to say three things with our life if we've got our sight right. Number one is I'm ahead. I live ahead. Come on, family, talk to me. I'm not behind. I'm not ambushed. I'm not overtaken. I'm not somehow the, uh, for some reason, I have met a lot of great believers who think that their life is, they know the enemy and God know more about their life than they do. That's not even scriptural. Let me tell you what the enemy does. Daniel chapter seven, the Bible says he comes to pervert the times and the seasons. Let me put it in our world for a second. What it really means is he tries to get you to miss your cue, to miss your moment, to miss your opportunity, and because of that, it delays the plans of God if not derails them. But let it be said that there's a fellowship church right here in Antioch that we weren't just looking with natural sight. We weren't just here with natural sight. We were hearing and seeing out of the things of heaven and we were responding to God accordingly. Why? Because I'm ahead. I had a student one time. He, had a, he took a nap before our youth service. And then he came in. Um, uh, he came in uh, to service that night. And I'll never forget, he told me in, in the nap he had a dream. And in the dream, Jesus came to him and brought a gallon Ziploc bag and, and handed it to him and said, take this bag and go to the grocery store down the road and stay in the pharmacy aisle and whoever is in the pharmacy aisle, if you'll lay hands on them, I'll heal them. So this kid wakes up from the dream, runs to the grocery store, forgets the Ziploc bag, true teenager, right? Runs over there. 
stands in the pharmacy aisle and can see the line is packed with people trying to get their prescriptions and their meds. Well, the, right then a woman comes and she has her bags, uh, her little bags of, of pills and she comes and, she, and he stops her and says, um, excuse me, ma'am. She says, yes. He says, um, listen, I'm from Fellowship Church. I'm a Christian and God speaks to us and he told me to come here and pray for people in the pharmacy line and whoever who uh, I would lay hands on, Jesus was gonna come and heal them. Can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah, please pray. He said, what can I pray for you about? I mean, it's not like she can say no either. I mean, you got some pills for something. For something, you either on that stuff or you got pain for something, right? So she said, uh, she said, well, I've always had this back injury and I've had this pain and really these, these meds don't even take away the pain, they just take the edge off the pain. I've lived with it my whole life and, 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 and so I, yes, please pray. He said, can I lay my hands on you? She said, sure. Lays his hand, simple prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I command this back to be healed. I command the pain to leave and never come back. And I thank you, this will be a new normal for her. In your name I pray, amen. When he said amen, she went, whoa, just like that, whoa. And she, he said, what happened? She said, I felt something. He said, well, we'll do something you couldn't do, test it. She goes, okay. This was, anytime, no matter what nation you're in, anytime someone's back gets healed, test it, sure. This is exactly what happened. So she comes back up, wide-eyed, goes back down. Comes up and goes down, comes up, goes down, comes up, goes down. Keeps doing this and she is starting to cry. The whole line is watching what just happened and people are like, me next. I got next, right? God is moving. And so she was so confident in her healing, she took her pills, threw it to the kid and walked out of the store completely healed and set free. An employee came and brought a gallon Ziploc bag and said, I, I don't know why, but I need to give this to you. Gave it to the kid, he put the pills in there, and then another person came, and another a person with a growth, and asthma. People were getting healed. Every one of them, boom, 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 got completely healed and gave the kid the pills. He showed up to church that night. I caught him in between, right, going in the service, and I, I, in the halls, and he said, hey, Pastor Chris, check. he had two bags. He said, hey, Pastor Chris, check it out. <laughs> check it out, we taking ground, baby. <laughs> Revival, <laughs> he's doing like, and I'm like, what are you doing? What, what are you? I thought he was trying to sell the pills to all the other kids. <laughs> because this kid has a past, and I'm just trying to journey him right. So, so I, I, mean, I said, what are you doing? He told me the whole story. Why would that happen? Because someone recognized I will always be ahead. If I will follow him, if I will surrender, if I will trust, if I will completely lean in with no, with no hesitation. I'm not just giving sections or parts or pieces of my heart and life. I'm giving it my all. I'm going everywhere with him. Why? Because I need to live ahead. You know, the Bible's very clear. It says time and again, Elisha would hear these plans. You know, I, I really feel like we need an arsenal just like this in the church today. What would it be like if we had praying, a praying church at a level where they were hearing, hey, go to this place, go to this, or go to this address, there'll be this list of names, it'll be at this time, and they are plotting to take mass amounts of life. But if you get there in time, get in touch with the right authorities, and they will show up at that place at that time, those people will be there. Friend, I'm telling you, mass shootings wouldn't happen, mass suicides wouldn't happen. I'm telling you that we would be dangerous for good, we would be a holy disruption. Anybody ready to be a holy ambush and watch God develop a spiritual sight and hearing? You get to do that when you say, I'm ahead. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. Number one, I'm ahead. Number two, I'm an ambush. I'm an ambush. I, I, I remember one time I was uh, sitting in my office. My door was closed. My assistant is outside of that door, and, um, and she's El Salvadorian, so she comes with all the spicy, all right, all the sauce, all the attitude, okay? And so I, I remember we're sitting there, and, and uh, all of a sudden this woman like storms our office. Now, we have an unlisted address. Nobody knows where we're at in Texas. And so she comes in and, uh, and, and she goes, where's Pastor Chris? I need to talk to Pastor Chris. Where's Pastor Chris? I need to talk to Pastor Chris. Now, I remember my sister, she, she didn't miss a beat. Where's Pastor Chris? I need to talk to Pastor Chris. She goes, hey, 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 don't you come in here acting all crazy. What you want to talk to Pastor Chris for? That's why I hired her right there. That's why I hired her. So I remember, I'm hearing this. I get up from my chair. I go to the door and I do what any man of God does in this situation. I lock the door. I ain't gonna get a case. You don't catch me on no Christian TMZ or anything like that, right? <laughs> so I remember, but I'm nosy, so I put my ear to the door to see what was going on, right? And, and um, she's like, I need to talk to Pastor Chris. What you want to talk to Pastor Chris for? And she said, a voice came into my car, gave me this address, 
and said that a Pastor Chris has a message for me. <laughs> I'm all on the other side of the door. I'm like, really? Because you never mentioned not one time, sir, that P the crazy women be dive bomb in the office today when I prayed. You didn't tell me. That. And then I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm not ready. And I'll never forget, he laughed at me. I'm not lying. Yeah, I, I said, I'm not ready. He went. <laughs> I'm t I feel like my life is one big meme. Anyone, anyone else? Like your private, aren't you glad at some point you're like, I'm, I'm glad nobody's here to see that. <laughs> you go viral real fast for all the wrong reasons. You know what I'm saying? Some of you laugh. Some of you nudging people are like, that's you. Husbands and wives are like, right? I, I, I'm telling you, I feel like God laughs at me. All. I feel like if God needs to laugh, he checks in on my life. Man, this has been a day. Like, where's Chris? This guy. This guy. Hey, Michael, Gabriel, come look at this. Chris, say it again. I'm not ready. <laughs> I know. I know. He's my favorite. That's how I feel like my life is. So I remember I said, Lord, I'm not ready. And he went, son, that's okay, because I'm ready. And when I'm ready, that's when you're ready. And I started recognizing that not only am I ahead, but if I surrender and follow in alignment with him, I also become the ambush. Friend, we're not outnumbered. I'm telling you, we're not overwhelmed and we're not overtaken. We are not the threat, we're the threat. We're not the minority, we're the majority. There are always more with us than against us if we will just open our eyes. So this lady, she's like, please, let me talk about group, please. Don't. I opened the door, I said, ma'am, ma'am, I'm here. I said, please, come on in. I told my assistant, you come too. In case anything pops off, I need that's that day one energy, I'm gonna need that, right? So, so she gets in this lady, starts telling us her whole story. She's about to go through her fourth divorce. She's got different babies with, with these men. It's heartbreaking, and she makes this statement. She says, well, this is something that happened to my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother. And I said, ma'am, listen, what I'm noticing is a generational cycle here. But I believe that by Jesus' power, we can break it, but we gotta start with forgiveness. You need to let Jesus forgive you, and then you can forgive these men. And she, you would have thought I slapped her mama across the face. The rage and the anger that she started mad. No, no, I want to do it. And then she went full blown mad. Ah, 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 right there on the couch. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, God, I don't have time for that. <laughs> I mean, and she is spitting everywhere. She, ah, ah, and demon juice is going all over the place. And I'm a germaphobe. <laughs> like, I don't do that. I don't, I don't listen. I don't even let people, I don't like people touching my food. I don't eat, I, I don't drink after my wife. I will kiss her in tongues but I will not drink after her. I don't even drink after my own kids and gremlins. That, that's gross. I got standards. Not a spirit. It's a standard. <laughs> so I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, God. So we start praying. We start battling. We start, ah, she's going this. And I'm telling you, my assistant, you know, let me teach you something about Latin and Hispanics. All right. We pray in English. That's one level. But then when they start praying in Spanish, I'm telling you, even Jesus himself gets out to, girl, you better back up. Better back. Michael, Gabriel, she ran you over last time. You better pay attention. Right? And I'm telling you, I'm telling she started praying, yes, Lord, in the name of, in the nombre de Jesus, the fuego, fuego de Dios, levante de. I'm telling you, she just starts going after it. This demon didn't even have a chance. I mean, it's just pow. She got set free, she got saved, and she's still involved in this church to this day. Why would that happen? What may have looked like an ambush really wasn't an ambush. It was a setup for God to break into the earth, for God to come through on the altar of someone's obedience. And I believe that God is gonna do that here with you today. You're not just ahead, you're also an ambush. The Bible says, I love this, it says, the Elisha prays, oh Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes. Let him see. He's not asking him to see what he sees in the natural. He's asking him, let him see in the spirit. Let him see from heaven's perspective over the balcony of the chorus of the great saints. Let them see. Open his eyes and let him see. You know what's interesting to me? Is I notice what the Bible says and the, what the Bible does not say. You ever notice this? And the Bible does not say, follow me, I, I, I think sometimes it's just as equally important to notice what's not said in the scriptures. Let me put it to you like this. Notice what Elisha doesn't pray for. He never, not one time, prays about this army. Not one time does he pray about the enemy or the circumstances or the issues. He doesn't pray in the box called doubt or worry. He didn't none of that. God had developed him, come on church. He had built him to be able to see things from a different perspective. And all of a sudden, watch, he says, Lord, open 
his eyes. The only thing that Elisha prays for is his blind servant. Could it be that this is a type and shadow, a prophetic picture out of the Old Testament of what Jesus is doing in the New Testament on this side of the cross, that is inter- he is interceding at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on our behalf, not just so we could be blessed, not just so we can be healed, but so that we could have our inheritance, our spiritual sight. I believe that the biggest issue we have right now is God might have too many blind servants. We've got servants, but can they see? We've got servants, but can they hear? And we got servants, but will they see, hear, and obey? Are you following me? I'm not just a head. I'm also an ambush. I would like to submit to you that this has been God's goal since the beginning of the scriptures, that he's wanted them to see everything the way he sees it. He's trying to, you, you, you'll find, let go to Abraham. Abraham's struggling with this promise of being a father and having descendants. So all of a sudden, God shows up and says, boy, go outside. This is the Christian Strata version. He goes outside, count the stars, and see if you can count them all because that'll be the same number as your, uh, as your descendants. That'll be your inheritance. He goes out to army mean, seven, 10, 11, whatever, and he loses count, and he goes, there's no way. There's no way. And God says, so will your descendants be. They'll be innumerable like the grains of sand on the earth. What was he getting them to do? He was getting them to see something different. Do you remember Joshua before he invades into the promised land? What does he do? He is taking a walk, and Jesus shows up with a sword drawn. And he says, see, look, I have given you Jericho. And they hadn't fought one battle. They hadn't thrown one spear, shot one arrow, hadn't pulled one sword from his sheath, yet he's already shown them. I've already given you victory you haven't even fought for yet. Are you seeing this? He goes to Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, look, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the harvest. What is he getting them to see? A harvest is ready. Do you remember Paul who is Saul on the road to Damascus is blinded by the encounter of Jesus. But when Ananias walks in that room and begins to pray, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road, Saul, has showed me that you were to receive your sight. And it says something like scales fell from his eyes and he began to see. I believe the scales of the church, the scales on your marriage, the scales on your babies, the scale on your job or your destiny are beginning to fall and you're gonna have piercing accuracy with the clarity that God gives you if you will just understand, I'm ahead and I'm an ambush. You know, I, I truly believe this has been God's goal. It's restoring spiritual sight. You'll find this is a part of Jesus' messianic job description that he is to restore sight to the blind. In Isaiah, in Luke chapter four, when he reads the scroll, restore sight to the blind. You, you gotta read the Bible with some humor sometimes. You remember John, I think it's John chapter nine, Jesus shows up and he sees a blind man. And then Jesus walks up to the blind man and says, hey, hey, you wanna see? I'm thinking, sir, like he blind. Like Jesus, he blind. Of course he wants to see. Hey, do you wanna see? And this guy's response, yes, Lord. <laughs> I'm sure it went that way. And I'm sure he was like, um, yeah, <laughs> right? And Jesus says, okay. So what does he do? He spits in the dirt and makes mud. And then he takes the mud and puts it in the blind guy's eyes. The blind guy don't even see it coming. I mean, it's, this messed up. I'm like, Jesus, that you play too much, sir. That's wrong. There's something wrong with that. And then he asks him, now what do you see? <laughs> I, he, and then this guy's response is, I see men walking around like trees. You see this? And then the second time he goes, okay. He spits in the dirt again and makes more mud. I mean, the CDC would be freaking out right now, right? (laughs) Takes it, puts it in his eyes. I mean, uh, again, the guy don't even see it coming. Puts mud in the guy. I'm like, Jesus, you're a savage. This ain't right. So puts the knife, and then he goes, hey, hey, now what do you see? And he says, I can see clearly now. Now, I would like to submit to you and what Jesus was doing is he was healing this man's spiritual sight before he gave him natural sight. Because you'll find when he says the first time, what do you see? I see men walking around like trees. What does he do? You'll find that trees are constantly synonymous and prophetically symbolized with people. Let me prove it in scripture. Psalms chapter two, blessed is a man who does not walk with the sinful nor sit with the seed of the scornful nor his del- or his delight is in the law and on the law he meditates day and night for he will be like a tree planted by the river whose leaves do not wither and whatever he does will prosper. Are you seeing this? 
Jesus said, you know a tree by its fruit because a good tree will bear good fruit and a bad, come on church, and a bad tree will bear bad fruit. He's not talking about having a green thumb. He's talking about recognizing the fruit of people's lives will tell you everything you need to know about people. And I just wonder if God is trying to open up the sight in certain people's lives. You're gonna look at your job different. You're gonna look at your destiny different. You're gonna look at you completely different. You didn't come missing parts. You didn't come with all the missing moments. You came with the extreme favor and love and passion of God Almighty and that's why he he is ambushing all the doubt and all the worry in the room. It's time that we had four eyes and we started seeing things like I'm ahead and I'm an ambush. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of times we're not in the trouble we think we're in. You're not in the trouble you think you're in. Elisha, thinks my, Elisha doesn't think my biggest problem right now is I'm surrounded by an entire enemy army. His biggest problem is I got a blind servant. Are you seeing this? That's his bigger, let me put it to you like this. May, perhaps, maybe, God is not testing you with trouble. He is trusting you with trouble. Perhaps the trouble that has come in your life was assigned to you because you were developed in the shadows, you were built, chiseled, and formed so that when you showed up and a Goliath was talking, you could go and sever his head. When you showed up and they threatened you with a furnace of fire, you didn't mind walking around in a fiery furnace. When they showed up and they threatened you with all kinds of things, lawsuits, defamation, everything, I'm telling you, you'll see it differently. You're not being tested, you're being trusted. Could it be we are complaining about what we prayed for? I'm just helping you out here for just a second. But I truly believe, I truly believe, perhaps when we're not, our side is not right, we're praying about things that don't matter. And we're focusing the time, effort, and energy of our prayers in a wrong direction. Or like James says, we are praying about it completely amiss or with the wrong motive. Are you following me? But if our sight was right, come on church, if God could sharpen us, if he could chisel, if he could begin to iron out the wrinkles and smooth out all the edges, I promise you, you wouldn't see things. You would see things at a national level differently. You would see things at an international level differently. You would see things about this generation you had never seen before, but it's all about getting your sight right. I'm ahead, I'm an ambush. And the third thing is, I'm an answer. Friend, Eyes that look are common, but eyes that see, totally rare, completely rare. I'm an answer. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just tired of the world looking at the church like, the, the, like we're the problem, when really I don't know another vehicle in a sphere of society that has, caused, that has continued to champion the message of salvation, hope, and healing. I don't know another organization that has constantly got together multiple ethnicities and multiple backgrounds, and there's a commonality called the resurrection, the blood, the cross, and the scriptures. I don't know anything else. We are not the problem. We are not the drudge. We are not in the mud. We're the answer. It's just like when people tell me about a young generation. Well, if this young generation, they are not the problem. They are the answer. They're an answer with legs because God doesn't send people to this earth to just suck free air. There is a purpose. There is a mentality. There is a thought. There is a blueprint. There's a fresh expression of God himself. We're an answer. You know, I, I love this about Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 19, because if we're gonna be an answer, we can't keep doing what we've done before and call it new, even though we repackaged it, we relanguaged it. No, we have to go for true new, an absolute pure new. And I, I believe, I love this Isaiah 43, 19. He says, he, he says this, behold, I am going to do a new thing. Yes. Not the next thing, which is what this world will teach you. Look for the next thing. Go after the next thing. What's the next scandal? Who's the next president? When's this next thing happen? What's the next? What, we've lived in a two-year time of a bunch of nexts. And God is sitting here. He's saying, I don't do next things. I don't do next things. I do new things. He says, behold, I'm gonna do a new thing. And then he says, do you not see it? In other words, he's saying, you're my people. How come you don't recognize my rhythm, my pattern? My ways. Remember what he said about Moses and the children of Israel. Israel knew God's acts. Moses knew God's ways. Are you hearing me? There is something about having spiritual sight. I, 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 and then he says this. He says, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not see it? I will make roadways 
in the wilderness and I will make rivers in the desert. In other words, I'll be the God of the impossible. And it'll be a forever sign for you that you can call on me. And if I need to call water out of a rock, I'll call water out of a rock. If I need you to walk on top of the water, I'll have you walk on top of the water. If I need to raise you out of death, back into life, literally and spiritually, baby, there is not time, space, or physics, or science that I will override to give you the type of life where you get your sight right and you get to say, I'm ahead, I'm an ambush, and I'm an answer. I love this, Jeremiah 33, 3 says this. It says, call to me and I will answer you. That just stirs me right there. Just call to me, I'll answer. And then watch this, it doesn't just stop there. And I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. You know, I, I remember the, being an athlete, I remember there was preseason and then there was in season. And preseason always uh, uh, you were always learning new drills and new plays and adding to your arsenal and you were putting more plates on the bar and you were trying to get stronger. You could, uh, you, you could take the risks of learning new things without uh, getting injured and having it wreck the season for you. I mean, preseason was important, but you didn't know who put in the work in preseason until it was season time. And you could totally tell who put the work in the off season, in the preseason, because in the next season, they were dominating, taking ground, they were breaking records, they were holding people to high standards, they were calling their teammates forward, and I believe that what God has done in this incredible history right here at this incredible church, that was all practice. That was all preseason. God's getting you ready for in season. What your last 20 years of marriage was, that was all practice. Your, your, your babies, when they start having grand paper, that, that's practice. Here's the real season. Let's recognize what season we're in. I truly believe if we will get our sight right, it'll change everything. Would you stand up with me? Would you stand up with me? I feel the presence of God in this room. I do, I feel the anointing, but I also feel this, I'm, something unique. I feel resisted, not by you, but that spiritual force that has tried to distract you to divide you, to get you to be half-hearted. I'm here to tell you, the days of part-time devotion are over for you. The days of part-time holiness are over for you. The days of part-time consecration, part-time revival, comfortable Christianity, passive power. I'm telling you, those days are done. And I believe God is not giving you a wishbone but in the spirit, he's given you a backbone again. And your voice will not be an echo chamber of what's been said before, but it'll be a fresh authority and a fresh anointing over your life. And what we need right now, more than anything, we don't need, I, I told this, I was at, in Mexico City yesterday at a men's conference, and I said, everybody's looking for a voice when we really need to find a verse. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I am moved in my heart that there is so many in this room that you're, you're looking in the wrong place and God gently this morning has been putting your focus back where it needs to be. I believe that this morning, this is dangerous ground. I believe this ground we're standing on, this is dangerous to cancer. This is dangerous to depression. This is dangerous to demons. This is dangerous ground to every bit of this dark world. And I believe that hope and healing are literally saturating this room. And it's time that we put on the spiritual muscle, that we take on the spiritual gain so we can be able to carry what God has called us to carry. I truly believe this is your moment. You know, if you, you probably lived your life, some of us in this room trying to get to a finishing line. When God's saying, you got the race backwards. I'm not trying to get you to a finishing line. I'm trying to get you to a starting line. I need you to start seeing right. I need you to start activating now. I need you to mobilize. I'm putting fire on this vision so that you can actually see what I want you to see. And the truth is, you, you don't get to take off until you take that first step, and that's surrendering your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for your sins to clean you up, not judge you, not humiliate you, not shame you. I got news for you. God's not in love with a future version of you. He's in love with you right now. And when God gets you, he knows what he's getting. He knows all the pain, he knows all the wickedness, he knows all the, 
things that, that have held you back for him, but he knows all the potential. He knows all the promise. He knows all the purpose as well. And he is passionately calling out to you now. What would make you get up on a Sunday morning and come to church? Only his fiery love for you. If you have never surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, I wanna give you the opportunity to do that. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you say, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, I, I, I need to give my life. Maybe I've never done this. I, 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 need, I need a hope that lasts. I need a joy that lasts. I need a, a trust that I can completely put my full weight of my life in. If that's you. I believe this is your moment. Or maybe you've been away from the church or away from the Lord, and I'm telling you, in some ways, you were scared to come back, but you took that step, and I'm telling you, God's meeting you where you're at. It's time to restore what he wanted to do. If you've never given your life or you need to restore your life to Jesus this morning with a full surrender, I'm gonna ask you on the count of three to raise your hand and make this a pure decision. I'm gonna give my life. I'm gonna surrender all and hold nothing back. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor Chris, that's me. That's me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, come on. This is incredible. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. People are making eternal decisions that will carry them in from this life, benefit them here and the life to come. Hands across this room. If you take that hand and put it on your heart, and I want to ask the whole church, would you pray with some passion, some volume, and repeat after me and say, Jesus, I give you my life. I thank you that you died for me, that you rose again, and you're alive today. Father, I surrender to Jesus, and I thank you that I'm ahead, I'm an ambush, and I'm an answer. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. Wow. Hey, they're going to come and give you some opportunity on what the next steps are, but I truly believe we're in a holy moment here. I feel like God's marking his people right now. And I felt like God, you know, prophetically, God will give me different words for different people. I was praying this morning, slept real fast. Woke up early, God, I, I want words for your people to move them into a, a maybe column, into the yes column, out of the doubt column, into the full trust column. And, and, I, and so I, I, I feel like God's given that to me, but I, I, wanna, I wanna say this first. If you've never been around this, I just wanna prepare you. This is not me being gifted. I am not a psychic. I'm just a child of God who hears really well and loves to repeat what he wants to say about you. That's what a prophetic... Uh, moment is right now and so uh, you in the jean jacket yep you what's your name yes ma'am yes ma'am Vanessa that's my sister's name Vanessa um, Vanessa would you hold out your hands like this wow Vanessa I see I, I kept walking over here and you were highlighted to me the whole story I kept looking at you hopefully it was in a non creepy way but I kept I kept doing this and you were highlighted to me and I feel like in your hands I see tornadoes in that hand and I see uh, piles of crowns in that hand. And I feel like, Vanessa, God's gonna mark your life. Those tornadoes represent power. And God's gonna mark your life with supernatural power. It's not just gonna be, you're gonna see signs and wonders, healings and miracles, but even for you to know that you have access to a higher level, to a higher authority, to higher resources. And I believe that that supernatural power is not just meant for you. It is meant to distribute. It is meant to release. I, I, I'm telling you, you're gonna be a holy nightmare for the kingdom of darkness. You're gonna be a holy ambush everywhere you go with that supernatural call. But I also see crowns. I see crowns, and I believe that these crowns, Vanessa, are for a uh, discipleship. I believe you're gonna have a voice of leadership. And these crowns are for you to raise up royalty and place them on sons and daughters and begin to speak into their life. And I believe as you keep under authority, like here at Life uh, at Fellowship Church, or Fellowship Church, I believe what God's gonna give you is a lifestyle of constantly raising and releasing with power and with royalty. Because not only do they need it, but you need it right now. You need to know the power of God is gonna follow you. You need to know that you are not just a daughter, you are a princess in the courts of an almighty God. And there is a ruling king in your life. So would you lift your hands, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for Vanessa. 
I pray, Lord, that this word would mark her life, that you would grab her attention both in this world and the next. God, that you would begin to activate this word I call supernatural power, and I call great royalty to the surface right now in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. What's your name? Right here. What's your name? Yes, sir? You forgot your name? Okay, Isaiah. <laughs> People get shocked, like, you talking to me? Yes. Isaiah, that's a good name. You got a good Bible name. Um, Isaiah, I have a, a word for you. It's actually in Isaiah chapter 8. And I want you to remember this. Isaiah chapter 8, and verse 13. It says this. It says, I give you a strong warning. This isn't a suggestion. It's, I give you a strong warning. He says, you are not allowed to think like the world thinks. And it says, what frightens the world will not frighten you. And I believe what God is saying is, Isaiah, I've been doing some things in the shadows. I've been building you and developing you where in places people have not yet recognized it. But when storms came, you stood. When confusion tried to crowd in, you stood. When you got ambushed and people ridiculed you, you stood. And God is looking at your faithfulness in this moment. And I'm telling you, Isaiah, you have a pure heart. You have a pure call of God on your life. And I truly believe that what the enemy is going after is the, the, path, the, the authority that's in your thought life and in your mind. And I think God's gonna restore some things and he's gonna release some things. Would you lift your hands, Isaiah? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Isaiah. We thank you for a strong son. We thank you for someone that will stand, even when it's not culturally correct, even when it's not popular, even when it doesn't make sense, even in his own mind, he will not be arrested by his own thoughts, but he'll still be moved by your word. I release Isaiah into something fresh right now in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. Hey, what's your name? You, you have sunglasses on? Yes, sir. What's your name? Can you yell it real loud for me? Jolani. Jolani. Did I get that right? Jolani? Jelani, I, man, I see, a, I see the word leadership over your head. You're a leader. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this. You're an influencer. What you do, others do just simply because you do it. The Bible's very clear. It says in Romans, it says, whoever, uh, 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 whoever has the gift of generosity should give freely. Whoever serves should serve diligently. But then it says, whoever has the gift of leadership should take it seriously. Jelani, man to man because I love and honor you. Take your call in your life seriously. You could choose to lead them one way or you can lead them his way. And I'm telling you, God is arresting you in this moment and putting a great claim on your life because it needs to be elevated. There's gotta be a greater surrender. There's gotta be a greater approach. You're mighty in the eyes of God. You're like a Gideon and God's plucking you out of where you don't belong and placing you where you do belong because that gift, he's watching over his word to perform it. I see a great grace on your life. Would you lift your hands as a prophetic sign that I received this? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for John. I release your fresh word, your fresh wisdom. I release your fresh joy, and I call him in to a sobering mind that he would take this gift seriously in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Is this a family right here? Is this... Mom and dad, dad, mom, right here in the white shirt, sir. What's your name? John. John, and is this your wife? Yeah. Okay, I'm glad I got that right because sometimes. <laughs> Yo, I got to tell you, I was in Portland. No, I was in Seattle. And I said, hey, ma'am, I see that you have two kids. And she's like, no, I have one. And the husband, no, I'm back up. I said, ma'am, sir, I see you have two kids. And, and the guy's like, no, we only have one. And her eyes went like this. And no, she, he's like, no, we only have one. I'm like, nope, you have two. God showed me two. And she goes, well, I was gonna tell him after church, but honey, we're pregnant. And I was like, oh snap! I ruined that video. Act surprised, you know. It's mom, John and, and your wife is? Megan. Megan, are these your, your girls right here? Yeah. Wow. You know, I feel like when God calls a, a person, he also calls a family. So what I'm doing is also a calling on my family. And I truly believe this, that you guys were highlighted to me and your sweet babies right here. But I truly believe this. I feel like your family has a gift of creativity. I feel this for the worship team too. But I, I, a great gift of creativity. Zechariah chapter one, verse 18 through 21. This is what God spoke to me this morning. It says that there were four horns of wickedness that started to pollute the, the land of Israel. They spread wickedness and suffering and pain. 
And God's response wasn't to raise up four kings or four generals or four prophets. The Bible says, as the enemy raised up four horns of wickedness, that it says he raised up four craftsmen, the creatives. And it says they began to create, and with their creativity, they caused a holy terror. And it says that they tore down the horns of wickedness and caused a revival to happen in Israel. I believe that the spirit of creativity is on this church. And I believe you're here to tear down the horns of wickedness. And it's not just music, it's the arts. It's not just the arts, it's the power of the written and the spoken word. It's not just the power of the written spoken word, it's design, it's architecture, it's blueprints. It's this renaissance rebellion of God. This holy rebellion towards the dark things of this world. And that gift of creativity is on your family. And I, I see grandparents who were creative, drawers and, and poets. I see there's a long line of people who just, am I, am I getting warm here? Okay, yeah. And I feel like that, that is a spiritual gift given to you by heaven. And I feel like God's causing a fresh, a fresh wind to blow or maybe a reactivation to happen. Would you take your hands, put on your hearts as a family? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for John and Megan and these two kids. I thank you for what they are into right now. You are pulling them in to something significant and strong. I release a fresh impartation, a fresh reminder of the call of God this weapon of creativity. Lord, I release it on this church, I release it on this worship team, that they would walk in this in such a fresh way, in the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, I feel led to close out and pray. If you're saying, Pastor Chris, this word was for me. I, I, I hope, you know, I'm preaching to myself right now. Because I'm like, God, I see these one way, and I don't see another way, but I know that you always create roadways in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And so I'm gonna raise my hand with you, but if you need prayer, saying, God, I need to get my sight right, or I wanna have clearer vision, or I wanna have greater vision, or I wanna have purpose, I wanna get accuracy. I don't wanna just know step three and four, I wanna know the next, the new, the right now, what you wanna pour out. If, if that's you, you say, Pastor Chris, that's for me, and you're saying, man, I, I wanna get my sight right, would you raise your hand with me today? Who am I talking to? Wow, look at these hands, wow, wow, incredible. Take that hand, put it on your heart, I wanna pray over you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I the smoke out of their life. No more smoke screens. No more ambushes. No more feeling overwhelmed. No more feeling overrun in their thoughts, in their emotions, in their life, in their relationships, in their finances, in their job, in their careers, in their marriages. I declare that a fresh sight is coming on your people. I declare that a fresh sight is coming on your men and women. And I break short-sightedness. I break short-term focus. I pray that there would be an eternal focus. I pray that there would be a longevity. I pray that there would be clarity. That even if opportunity and more money and more promotion and more prestige came, they couldn't be bought, they couldn't be distracted, they couldn't somehow be somehow divided, but Lord, they would stay very focused and resolute. You're putting our sight right now in the name of Jesus. And if you agree with that, give God 10 seconds of praise right now. Come on, raise your voice. thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're calling us to be the answer this week. You're calling us to be the ambush this week. Lord, we thank you for heavenly insights that you're washing over your church right now. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence. Let us carry it well this week. We all pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, come on. Can you show your love to Pastor Chris? Wasn't that an amazing word?
Pastor Chris, we honor you. We thank you for your deposit today. But hey, really quickly, as we uh, transition to a time of giving, we, we don't tell you to give around here. We just say pray, ask God what you should give and do that. And so there's three ways to give around here. You can go ahead, text your gift in to the number on the screens. You can go ahead and mail your gift in or you could drop it in the offering boxes on your way out. But go in the peace of the Lord today. Be blessed. You're an answer this week. And we can't wait to see you next week.